Welcome to Left Reckoning. I'm your host, Matt Leck. With me is one of my favorite historians, an independent historian now, uh, author of a book that I've mentioned, I know, recently on the show, um, The Many-Headed Hydra, um, Sailors, Slaves, Commoners, and the Hidden History of the Revolutionary Atlantic, alongside uh, Marcus Redeker. And today, we are going to talk about his uh, newest work, Red Round Globe Hot Burning, um, a tale of at the crossroads of commons and closure, of love and terror, of race and class, and of Kate and Ned Despard. Peter, thank you so much for uh, joining me today. You're, you're welcome, Matt. Um, now, I mentioned The Many-Headed Hydra. You've also uh, wrote Stop Thief, a collection of essays about uh, the uh, enclosure of the commons. Is it fair to say that Red Round Globe Hot Burning is sort of a synthesis of these works? And I'm just curious to hear you describe your approach to history and um, what you describe as sort of these counterculture or uh, resistance countercultures to enclosure. Sure, that's the, that's the big theme. Um, I think uh, that history needs to be rewritten, Matt, from the standpoint from below, number one. And number two, I think it's very hard for us to escape the dominant uh, historical narrative of privatization the, of private property. And when most through the vicissitudes of history, vicissitudes of history, as Kropotkin calls them, mutual aid and the commons has been a constant theme for millennia. And we need to recover that history. And so red round globe hot burning is um, one of many attempts uh, when I say many, there are other scholars who are also interested in this project. Um, <clears throat> I'd mention, you mentioned Marcus Redeker and his book on Benjamin Lay or Sylvia Federici and her book on Caliban and the Witch or um, Julia Scott on the Haitian Revolt, The Common Wind. So, um, but this book does have a relationship to previous ones I've, I've written. Um, the, it has a foreword by the Irish playwright, David Lloyd, who, who sees the relationship directly to the many-headed hydra, which uh, Marcus and I wrote together. It has a chapter on two people, um, Edward Despard and his African-American partner, Catherine, which became this whole book, Red Round Globe Hot Burning, as the hypotheses that we developed in Red Round in uh, Many Headed Hydra um, advanced as I became, turned my attention to the commons as such. Uh, at the same time, I should say, Marcus Redeker turned his attention to the slave ship. So we went in slightly uh, different, but um, complementary directions. Yeah, you mentioned those dominant narratives in closure and you, you take aim at the stadialist view specifically. Um, and I remember growing up in, as, uh, you know, in school in the nineties, and that was, it was, you know, the industrial revolution and look at all this great, you know, gifts that it's bequeathed us. And I, I am, I think like this book and a, a lot that you've mentioned um, others, the beginning of the understanding of this time period as an intensifying both of, you know, revolutions and the, the climate, um, you know, let's, well, actually, let, before we get to the Anthropocene section, I, let's just go over the commons a little bit more. Sure. Um, you have this uh, interesting poem here. I think it's uh, Irish in origin. Uh, and I'll just read it. Uh, the law locks up the man or woman who steals the goose from off the common, but lets the greater villain loose who steals the common from the goose. And you have a great section in this book where you take that poem literally. Um, what do we learn about the commons when we, when we do that? Well, you, we learn that the law indeed changed and many customary practices became criminalized. Um, this was this era was the time of the making of the working class. Uh, my teacher, Edward or E.P. Thompson wrote a book called The Making of the English Working Class, 
But um, Marcus Redeker and I and others have seen that the working class, in fact, was much bigger. It included um, many people who were not part of the English working class, especially Irish people, African-American people. But putting that uh, to one side, that's the law. And the law will lock up people. That means we'll imprison them or enclose them. And it's true, as Michel Foucault taught us, and as our early work at Warwick explored, the penitentiary began to replace the punishment of the body. And this uh, occurs in the United States with the Walnut Street prison in Philadelphia at the same time as George Washington's inaugurated, the same time that Wall Street is established, you get the first penitentiary. So the law will criminalize customs, will punish by the penitentiary, and let the greater villains loose, who stole the, co the commons from the goose. The commons here, I think, has many meanings, but in this historical context of around the 1803, 1802, it could mean either open field agriculture before fences were erected for the privatization of agriculture. Open field agriculture, villages and parishes had to cooperate among themselves to meet their own subsistence needs. But when that field is enclosed, by the gentry, they become the greater villains who take the commons from the goose. So a second meaning of the commons is, which we still find in the USA, like the Boston commons, or means just like a, similar to a park in the middle of a city or the, of a village where games can be played, where people can stroll for refreshment, where, uh, where geese can land uh, if they choose. And uh, so that's the second meaning of the commons. Both of these were threatened with what you called earlier the industrial revolution. But um, let me just say something about industrial revolution. If you think about the word industry, it really means diligent and resourceful application to some task, you know, when we say someone is very industrious. But industrial revolution really changed the nature of tasks and made them alienated, monotonous, um, never ending. That's, quote, the proletariat in the industrial revolution. Mm -hmm. So this, our work questions this notion of industrial revolution. And you you go back to the first person who wrote about it, Arnold Toynbee, in the 1880s. And the first chapter of his book on the Industrial Revolution, an expression that he coined for, for acad academic purposes, the first chapter is about the expropriation and enclosure of the commons, about the mm. privatization of land, turning land into real estate. And this happens in world history at the same time that the slave plantation is produced on the other side of the Atlantic. So Red Round Globe Hot Burning is about these two processes, yeah. um, slavery and real estate, but I'm getting away from the goose. Yeah. And let's go back to, to the dear goose and you know Mother Hubbard stories and um, you know the quill pen the goose has so many gifts to to humanity. It reminds and, me of the bu buffalo. That section reminded me of the buffalo when you, Native Americans talk about using all the parts of the buffalo. How you know, sort of resource heavy it is, or useful it is as an animal. Matt, what a good! I hadn't occurred to me, but of course the parallel is exact. There's so many uses, and the the people who lived with the goose and the geese uh, treated them not as pets, not as uh, not as not just to be butchered, but for many other things. Generally, children looked after the geese, and there's a complex cultural relationship to geese, just as there was to the buffalo, the great buffalo herds 
of the Great Plains. Um, I mentioned earlier custom, and it had been a custom. This was a, England was a part of, it had suffered or lived under a dominant religion, which was that of Christianity um, for centuries. And so the ordinary people make, have to make a deal and negotiate with the big landlords who often were archbishops and you know, super wealthy Christians. And at the time of Michaelmas or the mass for St. Michael, which is in September, it became the custom fought for by proletarians to have a goose for dinner. Right. So what I found suddenly is just what you'd expect from that poem, you know, in 1802, 1803, the, I studied the criminal records, you know, at the trial at the Old Bailey, that that time of year when the geese are stolen <laughs> is exactly the time, the feast of St. Michael. And so that was, a, I was, a, it was kind of a playful, uh, playful exercise of research yeah uh, it's it's speak. fascinating though to hear people like the you go into the criminal proceedings about some of these cases and you hear like actual like the the circumstances of this happening or and i think early in the book you talk about a uh, hay bale uh being set on fire and i mean those things are i think they speak to us from across time so in such a powerful sense i feel like yeah it it all has to do with resurrecting the world before privatization, before real estate, before the creation of a proletariat where, where all we care about is getting a job. All we care about is making rent. You know, these are the, these are the fierce social forces that impinge on us. And they come from a world of private property where property is, is produced by people by people having jobs where human activity is suddenly just defined as quote, the job with a little wage. But before that time, social relations were so different. And if I mentioned um, gleaning, mm -hmm. we would refer to that case that you mentioned. The gleaning is the, is the right of harvesters to go into the fields and collect the seeds and stalks that the harvesters had, had not been able to clear up, you know, with, uh, with their sickles or their scythes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, this is a tradition, you go back to the Old Testament of the, uh, of the, of the Bible, and it says, you know, leave gleanings behind for the orphan, for the widow, for the stranger. You know, so leave some, that's, and that, that was a basis of subsistence. You know, that produces bread for a poor family. Likewise, herbage or being able to put a cow on the commons or to use common land on a path or on a hillside. Um, that produces, to have such a cow brings milk for a family, mm -hmm. brings cheese. You know, and then on very special occasions, perhaps even some meat. But so that's herbage. Um, but every craft had such things like shoemakers had clicking, hat makers had uh, bugging, um, coal heavers had their perquisites, weavers had thrums. These are all um, takings or perquisites. Mm -hmm within the labor process, sometimes defined as wastage, you know, like the, the shipwright could take chips out of the shipyard as long as they were under three foot in length. So you find many of the houses of the shipwrights in Portsmouth or are just consist of three foot pieces of timber. Right. So it's using the materials of the world for your own subsistence without the mediation of money and the wage. That's 
custom. Right. And that's, that's the meaning of all those terms. Basically, it becomes a crime to get something unless it was authorized by capitalists or whoever is exactly the by, owner, according yeah. to the state. Yeah, like I think um, you mentioned uh, graduate school earlier. You know, sometimes you might uh, find graduate students customarily taking a ream of paper home. Mm -hmm. you know, or a box of paper clips. You know, these are just uh, perquisites of, of the task where graduate students are incredibly poorly paid, if, if at all. Yeah, um, I wanna just bring up uh, when we move to the Anthropocene, um, that my connection to this, uh, this book really spoke to me because I'm from Mandan, North Dakota, um, just 40 miles north of where the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, protests were, which you mentioned in your book as a modern forms of uh, commoning, uh, would you term it? Um, and uh, the highway down there and the highway I took into school every, every, um, every day was 1806. And that's named 1806 because that was the return voyage of Lewis and Clark um, coming down the Missouri. And so, and so that massive, you know, Louisiana purchase plus the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, which is, you know, why that was purchased to begin with, right? We want to make sure we have whatever resources we'll eventually make use of there. Um, t tell us a little bit more about, um, the, yeah, like the coal. I mean, you kind of mentioned already, like the sweepings, right? Um, but that formed, I, you mentioned it formed a policing um, structure. One of the early police was to make sure uh, guys on coal ships in England weren't um, taking too much energy. Um, I guess talk about like what we learn about energy from this period of time. Wow, Matt, that's a that's a deep, deep question. You know, and as a somewhat of an antiquarian historian, I like to get into the little nitty bitty, you know, and find the court records where this right. coal weaver, you know, was charged with taking so much coal and uh and then i it was a serious matter i mean human beings have derived their energy uh if not from animals and water then from wood coal or petroleum and then gas and then nukes but just looking at fossil fuel and wood this time of 1806, you mentioned, 1803 is when I think, or 1804, Lewis and Clark set out. Mm -hmm. That was a time of the transition from wood to coal within the economy in England. And uh, um, that happened later in, in what's now the USA. But in England, coal began to replace wood as the source of warmth, the source of cooking. Um, and then the source of power with the, for machines with the steam engine. And that, that happened in around 1800, 1803, the 1790s, at the same time as the enclosure of land, putting an end to the commons or attempting to. But that transition from wood to coal also meant that the forest or the woodlands was no longer a, was also under attack as being enclosed. The coal itself in uh, London became, you know, and I remember this as a child because I grew up in London, became part of the, of the pollution of our lungs, you know, the the um, different forms of bronchitis. Bronchitis was uh, diagnosed for the first time at the, in 1802. Mm. Um, pulmonary, other pulmonary, more serious or equally serious pulmonary diseases are excited and exacerbated by the infamous London fog, you know, which mixes uh, water and sulfur and uh, coal dust. And so, you know, every, the whole sign of this era of history is the cough, you know, or the wheezing, or, uh, you know, you ask later, what was it like to live at that time? Well, certainly 
that that's why people carried handkerchiefs, you know, to clean their mouth and nose from, this is why the buildings were dark gray. This is why uh, the rich people had so many servants to do so much dusting and cleaning. It's because of coal dust, because every, every room of a wealthy person had a coal fire in it. And that meant coal had to be brought to the house. It had to be carried from the coal bin up the stairs. This was work of servants. This was, this was big labor. But we see it today from the standpoint of the Anthropocene. Um, the, those who first noticed the growth of, of the proportion of CO2 in the stratosphere did so down in Antarctica when they studied um, samples from the glaciers to analyze the molecular composition at each stage and thus were able to see one of the beginnings of the Anthropocene as being around 1800, 1802, precisely the time that Jefferson wins an election, precisely the time that the Lewis and Clark set out. Um, there's not a causal relationship between these events, but they do belong to the same era of history. And we need, and this red round globe hot burning seeks to understand the forces at play at that time, which were forces of enclosure, not mm -hmm. just of land, but of other quote resources and the, and the criminalization of forms of commoning or the, because the commons is also a verb. It's not just a resource, it's a social activity of human beings uh, to, to meet their mutual needs. Yeah, and I like that you stress like historical, historical induction um, in, in sort of, uh, I guess, understanding or learning about these concepts, because I, I think commons and these sorts of concepts, they, they float around as ideas commonly, but act, um, knowing the details and the historicity of it, I think is, is very valuable. Um, and one other one thing that was being enclosed, uh, you know, it wasn't just land, as you mentioned, I want to find the um, portion here. But one of the more harrowing sections I've read in any book um, lately is you quote a, uh, a Reverend Joseph Townsend. And I just want to read part of this uh, quote on hunger, um, because th this awareness is uh, kind of yeah, I mean, really, you, you say it terrifying hunger will tame the fiercest animals, it will teach decency and civility, obedience and subjection to the most perverse. In general, it is only hunger which can spur and goad the poor on to labor. Um, um, can you just talk a little bit about that and Malthus and that sort of the, uh, and I guess maybe just generally the needs to, you know, reproduce yourself as a human being that were being enclosed at the time? Oh, Matt, I, I don't want to. I mean, it's too dreadful. Yeah. I mean, sorry. Um, it is because what we have to do here is to, to see how the ruling class or, you know, parts of the ruling class, and this guy Malthus was a parson, you know, he was a, quote, a religious person. Same with, same with Townsend, who you quote. These people are studying how hunger can as can goad or spur you know the the goad and the spur are developed as pain inflictors on animals the goad to the ox the spur to horses are now being used against human beings men women and children but metaphorically, that is by hunger. They're beginning to see how the state or the government through price controls can cause some people to starve. Some people can cause famine in different parts of the economy. And, and furthermore, they think this is a good thing famine and starvation will intensify the incentive to labor, will intensify obedience and compliance to the foreman, to the boss, 
And this is true at a social level. It's not just true in one factory or one workhouse, but people, but Thomas Malthus and Townsend, and there, there were many others. And of course they couldn't come out outright and say, you deserve to starve. Though Malthus comes very close to that. He says, not all people are invited to nature's table. That's, that's as close as he gets to saying, you have to starve. Yeah. What he says instead is that any form of poor relief provides an incentive not to work. And by work, they meant to produce surplus value for the wealthy, for the owners of the land, the owners of the machines, the owners of the resources of the world. So the Malthusian population doctrine it has these predecessors, as you point out, like Reverend Townsend, occurs at the same time as the enclosure of land, at the same time as the enslavement of people from Africa and Ireland in the quote, new world. At the same time, uh, yeah. So it's, uh, you know, when I responded to your question by saying I didn't want to talk about it, it's just so, yeah, it, it fills me with such anger. Yeah. And I think, you know, I, not to bring it too modern, but it does seem like I saw somebody tweet that the bipartisan agreement currently in America in the ruling class is that the poor don't need all that they say they do. And we should be skeptical of how much they need to, I mean, we're going through a pandemic and we can't, you know, provide for people. Uh, no, you're right. Least. This is a very old story. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I, I found it just shocking to see the consciousness and awareness on especially Townsend's part that like, because I mean, I think that's the game to like hide the ball with what exactly is being used to like get people to work. To, to see consciousness of it, especially at this time um, that you mentioned, such a pivotal time, um, is incredible. Um, another pivotal occurrence that happened, and you kind of mentioned this with slavery, um, Haiti, the Haitian Revolution. Can you talk a little bit about the significance of that in your narrative here, and uh, particularly uh, uh, Napoleon Bonaparte and Thomas Jefferson's uh, uh, attitudes towards the, towards the Haitians? Yeah, I'm not sure about their attitudes. Uh... Jefferson detested Toussaint Louverture. He was one of the leaders of the Haitian Revolt. Um, Toussaint Louverture, uh, Toussaint, the man of openings, to translate his name, was a former slave who led the first successful slave revolt in world history. Toussaint Louverture led and produced at this time that Lewis and Clark were going off in, into the uh, upper Missouri lands of um, the first, the second republic in the Western hemisphere, the USA being the first to throw off kings and queens, Haiti was the second. And of course the ruling class of the world detested and could never forgive this. And thus, the island of Saint-Domingue transformed from the richest part of the world to the poorest as a result of the successful slave revolt when Haiti was declared independent on the 1st of January, 1804. But the previous year, Napoleon Bonaparte had sent another transatlantic expedition from Europe and France all the way across the ocean to Haiti under uh, Rochambeau and previous under his son-in-law, Leclerc, a huge army to defeat the Haitian slaves but they were unsuccessful. Can anyone rid me of these gilded Negroes? Napoleon said. And he captured by treachery Toussaint Louverture, brought him back to, to France and 
and put him in a penitentiary in the Jura Mountains, where Toussaint uh, froze to death. Yeah, I, th I thought and, and shortly after, and we'll get to uh, Ned, but it, he died shortly after Ned was uh, hung in London. Is that correct? That's right. That's After right. The character. That's yeah. Right. Um, I mean, I, I think that's important because I think, you know, um, I mean, not that our audience is too um, taken by the mythology of Napoleon and, and Jefferson, but I do think that sort of um, the, they missed it, right? Like from our perspective, the revolution, like um, the Haitian revolution is every bit as salutary, if not more so than the other republics that were. Hey, born. Matt. Yep. We, both, we both are missing the key thing here. Okay. That's money. Mm. But Napoleon needed money for that expedition. And he got it by selling the Louisiana Purchase. So he sold Louisiana to go to Haiti? To, that's right. Wow. To raise the money for the Haitian expedition. So in fact, the people of the Dakotas, their destiny, and the people of Haiti have this historical connection, which we can see if we follow the money. Right. And the bankers for this were the Bering brothers. Uh, so they were London banks that even in the midst of war, the banks continue with their business, who, who, made, who did the, uh, the financial paperwork, as it were, for this purchase. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. Let's uh, yeah. Let's move to uh, uh, quickly to uh, Ked, Kate and Ned Despard, the titular characters of your uh, book here. Ned, uh, gentleman from Ireland, is that? Uh, uh, I'll let you introduce these uh, two figures. You're doing all right. You're doing fine. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to, um, well, I mean, I will say I haven't seen Poldark. Um, they are uh, apparently figures of season five of Poldark, which I, I am going to just check out because I, I can go for a bit of a historical romance now and then. Sure. Um, but uh, uh, interracial couple. Um, and uh, basically, Ned had the sort of Napoleon engineer artillery guy thing going on. Is that uh, understanding of that? Or is that a bit too reductive? No, it's not. It's, uh, he was a skilled worker of the time, as was Napoleon. And both of them are evidence of a, of a key theme of the revolutionary era, which is the, the career open to talents. Mm. You know, the land of opportunity, as we say, now is possible uh, because of uh, the aristocrats, though traditionally militarists, did not study science and ballistics the way Napoleon had and the way that Despard did. Despard was very good at math and geometry, essential subjects for artillery. And he, um, yeah, he belonged to an Anglo-Irish or gentry family. He had, I think, seven brothers and sisters, maybe more. Um, grew up in the, in the middle of Ireland, uh, was a, as a as a boy, detested the Bible, listened, spoke Irish, became a page boy in the English uh, ruling household at Dublin Castle, um, joined the army, went to Jamaica, like many uh, people in the British army, you know, had a concubine had, as a nurse, as a cook, as a laundress, but they formed a partnership, Catherine and and Edward Despard. And this person, these people are the center of this book, Red Round Globe Hot Burning, because she was the Angela Davis of her day. She was the Ruthie Gilmore of her day. That she opposed the penitentiary at the time of its birth. You know, you read Michel Foucault, Discipline and Punishment, or David Rothman, The Birth of the Asylum. The penitentiary comes at this time, but it's not without resistance. And it was a, a woman, women, who formed committees to prevent the common lands from being used to build penitentiaries. I mean, they, in the end, they were not completely successful, of course, because penitentiaries were built, but uh, she was a leading proponent of the abolition of the penitentiary as, as they both were leading abolitionists of slavery 
all over the all over the world. And because he changed the experience in Jamaica, then the experience on the Mosquito shore of what's now Honduras and an, an expedition up the San Juan River, you know, which is separates Nicaragua from Costa Rica. This, these experiences of different forms of commoning among indigenous people, among enslaved people, gets him thinking. Not only thinking, he, his body depends on this help and on, on the knowledge of the commons in these rainforests, in conditions of war. So when he is thrown back to England because the planters of what's now Belize or British Honduras uh, didn't want him because he, he believed in equality and he did not believe in a race, the race line, the color line, they threw him out. And he returned to England and he joined Jacobin and Irish revolutionary forces in the British Isles, in the what will become the United Kingdom. So his story, and uh, you know, I'm not sure how, uh, I'd be interested to see what you make of Poldark. Um, mm. I'm told that the, the actress who plays Catherine is very good, very successful. Uh, it's great to see to see her acknowledged uh, and to see the presence of uh, black women in England at last acknowledged. You know, so many English nursing has a basis in uh, Caribbean and, and black women going way back into the 19th century, into the even into the 18th century. Um, certainly the arts of love were developed for the House of Lord by African-American uh, women. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that when they returned to England, nobody challenged, there's no record of anybody challenging their marriage um, on the basis of a color line. Um, uh, you know, but there obviously was, you know, color prejudice existing then maybe just wasn't as developed or what's the status of the color line? And um, I also talk a little bit about Kate as, um, what she was doing when Ned was in prison, um, uh, you know, in terms of her output and what her role was there. Yeah, he was in prison. Then she uh, wrote letters to the newspaper. She lobbied members of parliament. She uh, helped him with his writings, smuggling them out of prison. In fact, his, uh, his last speech at the gallows is a, a production that the two of them uh, produced that they wrote together and that I'm tempted to read aloud. Um, and so her, her words of, of liberty, uh, her actions as a lobbyist, as an organizer of other women for other political prisoners uh, in the prisons and penitentiaries of England, in Shrewsbury, in Tothill Fields, in Clerkenwell, these prisons were called Bastilles, you know, named after uh, the French Revolutionary Fortress that was taken, that the whole world celebrates on the 14th of July. Yeah, you write that the Bastille that was even more significant in the in England. Um, was is that, am I remembering that correctly? Or they, or they really, it really resonated with them. Like it every resonated prison, right. very much with them. It, I mean, it's, if we see this as an era of enclosure, it's not just land and it's not just handicrafts which go into factory behind factory walls. It's also punishment. It goes under prisons. So uh, this is where the mind forged manacles come in, you know, that, that you, we find in the poems of William Blake. Uh, yeah, so she was very, very active uh, indeed. Uh, he suffered from malaria. Um, he wasn't even permitted a spoon uh, to mm -hmm. eat his gruel. Uh, there wasn't glazing or glass on the window so that the rain and the snow came into his cell. Um, and what was he being held for, just so people know? Well, on suspicion. In, fifth, in 1795, there two acts were passed where it was made a criminal offense 
punishable by uh, the penitentiary by imprisonment to criticize the government. Uh, then uh, he was active in the London Corresponding Society, which called for uh, abolition of slavery, uh, universal man, um, adult suffrage. Uh, he was also active with the United Irish a Revolutionary Organization for the liberation of Ireland from the English imperial yoke uh, that, that rose up in 1798 and was, uh, we would say now, international in mm. that there were Irish people in, in the, what, the USA, there were Irish people in Canada, Irish people in Australia, all Irish people, especially in England. You can't look at a building in England from that era without thinking of the Irish laborers. You can't imagine a meal without imagining the Irish harvest workers of the time. So he was active in the underground and conspiratorial work of what we would call now national liberation. And he was found guilty uh, in 18, or he's arrested in November 1802. I'm pausing, Matt, because that was the same time that the molecules were being discovered by George Dalton up in Manchester. And our modern atomic theory comes from that time. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking recently, you know, what is the relationship between that kind of, we might call it vulgar materialism, you know, that everything's an atom to the revolutionary struggles that were happening at the time. And I, I, I haven't thought it through successfully yet and definitely need, need help with that. Anyway, with 40 other proletarians, Despard was arrested in November. And then in, in January, he's tried. And in February, he's hanged decapitated and he was sentenced to have before he's before he was killed to have his uh, guts his intestines brought out and burned in a fire before his eyes um, and then after he was decapitated to have his four limbs severed to be hung up at the gates of different cities around the realm uh, but those forms of butchery were omitted thanks to the work of Catherine Despard, who begged the prime minister and Lord Nelson, who had known Despard, you know, back in an expedition up the San Juan River to omit those for, that form of torturous butchery. Mm. And the, um, she was so powerful that I think the, if not the prime minister, then a leading minister of his actually wept. Mm. So I think to give the, the ruling class is now developing sentiments uh, to go along with its cruelty. Mm. So it's possible to be, quote, humanitarian and cruel at the same time. Interested. Yeah. Anyway, that's just on a personal level. Yeah. Um, so that's that's their story, you know, briefly in a nutshell. He 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 suffered with seven other people, uh, veterans of wars, shoemakers, building laborers. Uh, they were in earnest. They they sought um, to do a. Uh, they they sought to turn Windsor Palace into an orphanage. Mm. They sought to turn the Bank of England over to the pe people's subsistence. Uh, they were revolutionaries and in earnest. Yeah. Um, well, Peter, I think that's a, maybe a good place to end. I just want to add, you know, you mentioned William Blake and there's all, all sorts of figures, you know, you may have heard about in different contexts. Uh, Oladon Equiano also um, plays a role in this. Um, I, I just no, oh, this is the wrong one. Um, I just love your approach to history and just how dense it is. So, um, uh, Peter, thank you for joining Left Reckoning. And uh, next time you have a book out, I uh, hope you'll join us again. You're welcome, Matt. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>